is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, also blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballots. We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures to be on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in the debates and interview them to educate and inform the public of their options. On our website, LibertarianProgressive.com, you'll see all our interviews of those candidates, over 35 and counting now. Today we're interviewing Gary Kona's No Party Affiliation for the U.S. House or, uh, of Representatives in Florida, District 4. And you can find more information at Gary Kona's, G-A-R-Y, Kona's, K-O-N-I-Z, 4, F-O-R, Congress.com. And Gary, we're delighted to have you with us here so we can know who's running for Congress besides a Republican or Democrat. Thank you for taking the time. Let me ask you, is this your first time running for office, sir? And what inspired you to run this year and also not run as a Republican or Democrat? Thomas, this is my first uh, time uh, running as uh, independent here in the, in the Florida's 4th Congressional District. And uh, I'm running as an independent because I, I want to uh, wrestle with the bipartisan aisle issue and come to terms with the gridlock that's occurring in our government by being able to work both sides, the Republican and the Democratic parties, uh, independently. So we have a lot to accomplish here. And um, I have a 10-point plan, which I intend to implement if, implement if elected which will return our country to the intentions of our founding fathers for integrity and principle. So this is my main objective here. I'm running basically and primarily to represent the working class people here in America who are being very grossly shortchanged in the economic sphere by mercantile philosophies of aggrandizement and particularly greed, that uh, let the people starve capitalism is the philosophy that's overrun our country. And so we need to get back to our basic uh, principles of, of taking care of the people here. The people are, the, are, are what matters, and not the uh, economics of who's the most wealthiest uh, corporation there is. So uh, it's, it's especially uh, to represent, defend, protect the working class population in America in the war of the haves against the have-nots. And it is a war. It's an economic war. And the have-nots are suffering. They're losing. They don't have money to go to the dentist to fix their cars, to feed their families, to pay their rent, and every other thing that's uh, the necessities that people need to survive. So my basic format in the 10-point plan is to initiate a legislation called the Fair Wage and Benefits Act, which is uh, going to uh, establish a cost of living minimum wage. And they've been frightening people with a $15 an hour minimum wage, which it may be held, it may hold true in New York City and Atlanta and Seattle, where the high rent districts are, all, and the money is all relative how much you have to, to pay out to survive. But here locally in Jacksonville, and I, I would say throughout the state of Florida, it's 10.55 an hour. This is what we're going to ask for as a minimum wage. The bottom line, this is what the government's general schedule wage rate starts at, GS1. And these are negotiated salaries on the federal level, uh, what people need to survive. And so we're going to start at GS1, and then we're also going to establish appropriate prevailing wage rates for all the trades and for every other category of work that exists through the industries in America, GS1, GS2, GS3, whatever that wage rate is, that's what's going to be the minimum wage for those categories. So it's not up to the employer. It's not going to be left up to the employer anymore as to uh, working off the minimum wage of 8.25 an hour. That's here in Florida and less in other places. Now, would this so be that, adjusted with inflation, mask? And every year it would be adjusted for inflation. Yes, the same. it would always be on par with the government's general schedule wage rates beginning at GS1. That would be the basic minimum wage for America. And that's only that's fair. And it, it just appalls me that this country, with all the upholding of rights and the calling for rights that everyone is asking for, this right and that right, 
that we don't have afford our people here the basic dignity of the right to survive their livelihood, the work that they do. And that's what we need to do, uh, Thomas. Uh, and that's primarily why I'm going to run, as an, and why I'm running as an independent, to be able to persuade this issue on the floor of Congress and then to the Senate as we get there. Our motto is a democracy that works for all the people. And uh, we're also calling for an FICA payroll deduction, deducted affordable national health and dental care Medicare card plan for everybody in this country that uh, they would contribute uh, on their payroll and they would have a Medicare card and that would cover the expenses that they need for their medical bills. And that, this right. is something that we and And also... So uh, Medicare for all. Medicare for all. Yes, Medicare for all. That's the only, that's the only appropriate thing to have. People, they can't afford the cost of the insurance, and we need to regulate the essential costs of living for everyone, which would include the medical industry as well as all the other necessities that people need and depend on, like uh, oil and and water and sewage and everything else. It's just things that people, uh, they just can't be uh, held o- held over the barrel for. So uh, the same would go for cost, the cost of uh, medical insurance and whatnot. So that everybody will have a fair chance of survival here. Education right. is another um, opportunity. What about education as well? And education, uh, this is a very primary uh, point, and I want to bring up the next issue of my legislation, which I intend to introduce, which is called the Full Faith Fiat Issue Bill, the Fiat Issue legislation, which will allow the federal government to issue currency directly from the Treasury on demand of the Congress, called Fiat Issue on Demand, for to meet all necessary contingencies that we need to uh, provide for the infrastructure, public employment, the environment, emergency disaster relief, education, national security, and our safety, and all the other things that matters that we need to concern the state that we don't have enough uh, tax resources to provide for, and which are ailing and falling, crumbling and falling apart. So the, the, uh, the old system of supply and demand economic taxation is on the way out. It's just it's not current, and it doesn't uphold the present needs of the government that we have to maintain in order to survive the, in this country as a people. And I'm, I'm telling you, Thomas, the inertia of the status quo of the upper-class mindset of let the people starve capitalism is not going to do the job for us. They're just going to continue on in their in their mindset, and they've got theirs, and... Uh, they make theirs off of everybody else's work that they're not uh, taking the time to provide for. So my campaign, my campaign is not about rote party bot voting, but of having a viable platform of substance to vote on, which I have. So this is why I'm asking the people to support me. The campaign is going really well. Uh, I, I don't really know exactly how we're going to stand up against the Republican candidates. I am a candidate. I haven't been able to debate with him. Uh, we've just been debating with the uh, Democratic candidate, and there's one write-in in our, in our district. So uh, write-ins don't have very much hope for being elected, but that is the issue as it stands. Yeah, so, so we're my website is www.garyconinsforcongress.com, and I explain everything very thoroughly there. Yeah. I'd also like at some point when you have a chance to comment, but I'd like to go over the rest of the issues of the 10-point plan with you before the show concludes, Thomas. Sure. We'll you have some questions you wanted to ask me? Yeah, absolutely, and we'll have some follow-up questions as well. Um, n- another issue that you did have on the 10-point plan was the environment, pollution. How would you address that? Well, th- here's the issue with the pollution. Uh, this also would be uh, handled by full faith uh, currency issue. Whatever matters that are polluted our atmosphere or our soil or our water need to be taken care of immediately by the federal government. The pollution itself is the issue that needs to be taken care of, not whether the individual industries uh, have the money to pay for the pollution. And so they've been going allowing these industries to pollute because they hire people. That's the issue of the basic. Instead of going in there and fixing what needs to be done, realistically, we want to clear the pollution up and not drag it out uh, and horrible, uh, we get this be- be- Beijing-type effect going on. I still don't know it's Los Angeles that way somewhat. But right. th- this is a horrible, untenable condition. They need to fix that and not uh, be quarreling over who's going to pay for it. We get in, we wait in there with our fiat issue money. 
The money is going to spend just the same as borrowed money. We're $19.4 trillion in debt. We're never going to pay that debt off, and they keep borrowing more money into it. It just well, doesn't make any sense. This is why we've got to take care of the, the business in a different way. Okay, Thomas, what? Yeah, it reminds me of Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War issued greenbacks. Um, is that something – are you familiar with that? Uh, I'm not specifically familiar with that, that issue, but that is something uh, of, of, of a stance that we need to take with this, uh, the same similar stance. It's money that spends yeah. the same as money. It's, it's backed by the full faith of the United States government. It's currency. It's not going to devalue the dollar. It's a, it's a kind of a hybrid solution. It's not going to replace taxation. It's only going to supplement the deficits that we have that we need to fill the holes about. So it's, sure. it's really going to be beneficial. Plus, all that money is going to be returned to the economy uh, in the form of taxation. And also, with the increase in spending purchasing power that the consumers are going to have, with the increase of uh, the uh, minimum wage law, that's all going to uh, increase the purchasing power and stimulate the production of goods and services. So that's going to help business out all over the country, and, they're, and also uh, with the hiring in the private sector. So, yeah, there'll uh, be a larger consumer base. Let me ask you yes, about the... Uh, uh, the idea is that uh, yeah. the more money you put into the economy, the better off it's going to be. And so we don't need to starve the economy. As it, the economy is starving now, and with it, everything is withering and dying. So uh, we need to... You can't just, like farmers, you just can't keep taking and taking from the soil without putting some stuff back into it, nutrients. And that's what we need to put some nutrients back into our society in the form of revenue. Okay. Well, let me follow up on some of the election issues. So you said you've been in a debate um, and the Republican is not participating in the debate. Some could make the argument whether that's for his own interest or whether it's, you know, he's deciding to do that in regards to the interests of his constituents um, to make a fully informed decision. But do you have any other debates coming up, sir? Oh, yeah, we, we have uh, one more debate coming up. Uh, it's, it's with a, a school, the Florida, Florida State College debate. <clears throat> but they said that they had their Republican debate when the, pri the primaries, before the primaries, they had seven people running for the Republican primary. So they had all their debates, but they're not allowing them to debate with us. I'm, I'm, uh, we, I've been protesting that. They, I need to have the Republican candidate there so everybody will have a clean view going into the election of who's going to do what. Yeah, in a sense, I mean, it almost seems like they're forfeiting outs. But let me ask you this. If you were elected on November eighth, two 2016, and you became the incumbent, in other words, two years from now, and let's say you had a Republican or Democrat challenger or even another independent who is on the ballot, would you opt to not debate them or would you be willing to debate any future challengers if you yourself were in the future an incumbent? No, I would debate everybody. I want to talk about the issues. This is what it's all about, about consensus. We need to discuss what, what we want to do here and mm -hmm. why we don't want to do certain things and, and what is good and what is not good. So uh, everybody everybody has some good points, and everybody is arguing uh, very very aptly th their own business agendas uh, that I've I've come across. But uh, nobody is taking up the concern for the working people, and this is what I'm just stressing and stressing. We need to do this for the for the people here. The people are what matters, and especially uh, in a, in the black community, they've been calling for. Uh, atonement for this slavery issue, uh, reparations. And on my 10-point plan, I had uh, the issue of restoring the dignity of the American Indians and uh, having their sovereignty issue ex restored and uh, to what extent that we can uh, make up for the injuries of the lost past treaties that were lo uh, lost and forfeited by to, by the, to them. And, uh, so in making up for the uh, issue with the American Indians, uh, we can also take a look at what we've done to the, the black communities. The black communities are in desperate trouble. They, uh, there's, no, there's no employment. The education has fallen down because they have no tax base to support their public schools. And uh, there's, the drugs have taken over the community. Chicago is a horror story. There's a war zone going on. But every, essentially every community, that way the black communities are suffering from the drugs. So you asked that one point about the, what are we going to do about the drugs. I say uh, I like your ideas, and they're, they're my ideas too. Education, 
and dealing with it as a health issue, but we also deal, have to deal with it as a lethal war issue. And so I want the military to come in. If I'm elected, I'm going to press for martial law, and the military will come in and remove the drugs from the cities forcibly. And for those who are dealing the drugs, they will bring it into the country, and uh, I'm going to order them uh, uh, the death penalty for them. That's going to be the penalty. There's no more uh, no more life sentences or anything for these drugs because they operate out of the out of the prisons anyway. So we're just going to remove them from society. So that's my plan. If we can get, and, and particularly, I want to deal with the heroin. The heroin is the insidious drug, and these drugs are not, they're psychologically, pathologically, uh, an injury to the people and to the society. They're physically, mentally, emotionally maiming, and they have an adverse physical, mental side effect. And they, they make people insane, and they cause all this uh, violence and theft and whatever they need to do to corruption. Everything goes along with these drugs. It's the heroin is particularly to remove the heroin yeah. from the society. The you know, heroin. The, pro- yeah, I'm sorry. The heroin production has increased greatly since you know the war in Afghanistan, and um, you know, and the Taliban growing a lot of it and a lot of heroin is actually in a lot of prescription drugs like oxycotton and which many people are addicted with i mean so is it fair to prosecute someone selling drugs on the street versus someone who's a you know giving prescriptions that gets people just as addicted well the, the, the doctors themselves i mean they've been uh, I, I hope they've been cracking down on the drugs but there's so much corruption involved with it but the doctors shouldn't be issuing these medical prescriptions to people. They have the lines outside the door. That CBS had it on the news. They're backed up around the corner to get the prescriptions for their drugs. And uh, so uh, these are terribly addictive drugs. I know when I was growing up, uh, those drugs had to be handled very strictly by the doctors. The people had to be weaned off of them. And this is not something that's occurring right now. They get the prescription for uh, narcotics for anything that any they contain that they want. Oh, uh, now, there's a, no, yes, just using heroin as an example, I mean, there's no doubt the withdrawal process, a detoxification for heroin, you know, we've seen movies on it, people might know real life people, and, and you see stories about people taking these, like, like meth and stuff like that, and their teeth are falling out, and then some of these other, you know, designer drugs where people are, like, biting people's faces off and stuff like that. I mean, that's, you know, in one category, and those people are definitely victims and causing victims, but there's a whole other uh, area of victims. Um, let's take uh, cannabis or marijuana, for example, which a lot of people don't think is stronger than alcohol, and we already tried alcohol prohibition, and that caused a lot of, um, you know, underground markets, and, uh, you know, we've tried the war on drugs for over 20 years and spent billions of dollars, and there's families that have been split apart, um, you know, what, what do you say about, uh, you know, states like Colorado and Washington and Alaska who are legalizing uh, marijuana? Well, it's a very, very poignant issue to discuss. I'm not quite sure what uh, medical marijuana is all about, uh, whether they've legalized it. Uh, everybody's taking a wait-and-see attitude about it. But I, it's definitely, uh, I think needs to be removed from the issue of the hard hard drugs, the hard heroin especially. So you wouldn't compare it to the same as meth or heroin or some of these other hardcore drugs like you're saying? No, I, um, wouldn't, com- I, would, I wouldn't compare that. I, I think it has, an, has another, uh, another category of its own. I don't believe it should be legal. I don't think it should, the children should have it, access to it. I think it causes... Uh, from what I've researched, it causes uh, severe psychological uh, afflictions uh, in the people that use it. So I'm not I'm not really sure whether that should be made legal or not. So I'm not I'm not uh, going to make it legal. I, I would vote for it not to be legal here. So right. And Gary, just fine. two more follow-ups on that, and we'll go to the rest of the issues, because you're not just a one-issue person. You have a 10-point plan. And even if someone disagrees with you on a couple of issues, doesn't mean that overall you might not be better than the status quo, um, and uh, and doesn't mean that you're not open to you know discussion and debate. 
What about um, two arguments about, uh, you know, like you've seen that guy in the Philippines who is, um, you know, having kind of a clearing of uh, drug dealers. Um, you know, they don't have any Fourth Amendment rights there. And, you know, they are literally killing people in the streets who are just even assumed to be a drug users or dealers without any trial or anything like that, you know, and, and there could be a case made that some of the police that are prosecuting being judge, jury and executioner, you know, are just using this as an excuse to eliminate some enemies that they might have had. And what about the right of a person to fail in society as well? I mean, it might not be a good choice, but, you know, people do have a right to fail if they want to. They shouldn't affect any others in the right to fail but for them as an individual, maybe they have a right to fail. Well, Thomas, who's, my attitude is this. Who, who's ever supplying these drugs, bringing them into the country, the smugglers and the, the major traffickers, uh, for them, under military tribunals, they will be sentenced to uh, death and put to, put to executed. And the rest okay. of them will be treated as a medical issue and put in medical quarantine for uh, the length of time that it takes to detox them. And so that's uh, my solution to the problem. And uh, I want to tell you that I, when I fought in the war in Vietnam, we came home, this entire country was devastated with drugs when we returned here. This is just in three short years. Something happened here in 1966, 1965. And uh, we were in a terrible war. You talk about L an LSD war and a PCP uh, angel dust war where, where these drugs were being inflicted on the innocent population and no one was able to do anything about it. The thing with heroin and, and with cocaine, these drugs that you snore and crystal math up your nose, those drugs are, can contaminate the atmosphere around the people that they, they can walk out into society and infect other people with the drugs. It's like cigarette smoke or it's drug air. So the, there's a very other serious reason why we don't want those drugs around us in our schools and our shopping areas, places where we congregate. Somebody who packs their nose with heroin and comes sits down next to you in the church. I mean, it, it's something that is just, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect you psychologically and mentally and physically. And they can drop drugs on people. They can cook the drugs. Uh, they can mash them up, put them in your orange juice. They can squirt LSD into a container. You wouldn't even, with a, with a needle, and you wouldn't even know that the container's been breached. So uh, this is what the war that we've been putting up with. And it's still going on. And in the heavy uh, drug areas in the city, in the cities, it's, uh, it's a, a nightmare what these gangs are doing. Uh, with these, uh, with these drugs. So militarily, city by city, just to go through. And, and now it's up into the middle class, into the upper middle class. These people are heroin addicts. And all the uh, industry, the uh, music industry and the Hollywood. So we've got a serious, uh, serious problem. The, the, and the, the drugs are affecting our, our standards of education, our standards of governing, and everything that we uh, hold dear here in, in this America. America is more... And just a country and a place to live. It's a, it, has, it stands for something. It has an ideology. And the force of the standards that we live by, that we profess to live by, is what maintains us. If we start losing those standards, and one of the things I'm talking about is uh, the, the morality issue that we need to legislate for a national morality clause. That, well, I, uh, we're not gonna... I agree. I want to agree with you on some point. Because John Adams once said, you know, the type of country that we're building will only work with a moral society. So, I mean, you can't... Moral society, yes, Thomas, that's correct. That's, that's absolutely right. Morals. But you can only have true morality, I think, if it's voluntary and people can't be forced into morality. I mean, they can be incentivized, maybe. But, um, you, you know, so I do think uh, education would probably be the best way to approach it. And, you know, we've had... Uh, the war the war on drugs is the longest war it's longer than the afghanistan war and certain sometimes it's also the amounts as well i mean there's scientists right now studying that small minuscule amounts of lsd might actually have some benefits to the brain not any amount that would get anyone high or seeing anything crazy or anything like that but uh so sometimes you know you can it's the amount as well as the substance itself and um 
But let's move on on that because I, you know, one thing that we do agree on is to agree to disagree and and our First Amendment rights and also the need for, um, you know, equal representation in the media for third party candidates. And uh, so let me ask you about, um, you know, about the working people. What about small and mid-sized businesses as well? I mean, I guess one of the arguments you're saying is that if there's a bigger consumer base, that is going to help small and mid-sized businesses overall anyways, right? Overall, yes, it is. And that's one of the selling points of, of my plan for the uh, increased minimum wage, the cost of living wage is that the businessmen in the short run see it as they're going to lose a certain amount of revenue. Each, uh, each dollar an hour is 2000 more a year in salary. So each dollar an hour that they raise. So what, they, what they're losing in that, they, they are surely going to make that back up, increase, increase volume of business of people uh, all across the board, depending on how they want to advertise and sell their products and compete in the market on a real uh, issue of, of uh, being innovative and having... Uh, the, the best plan, and so not not just skimping on their wages being uh, the only relief that they have uh, to make money for themselves. So I'm sure it's going to benefit all. I know it's going to benefit all the small businesses uh, that is across this nation and uh, increase their their uh, ability to hire people as well. Now let me ask you a follow up question about infrastructure um, and energy. Uh, you know, you did mention oil as one of the main things. I some people say that we might be addicted to oil. I, w- I guess I would agree with that. It, but we do need it. I mean, without a doubt, our society is dependent on it. Do you think with the fiat money or sh- would uh, you support investing into new forms of energy um, in the future for the future so we're not as dependent on oil? Because it's not going to last forever anyways. And uh, it might have a cleaner environment as well and create more jobs. What do you think about... Um, you know, renewable energies, alternate forms of energy, whether it be solar, nuclear, uh, et cetera. Oh, absolutely, Thomas. And this goes into the uh, health, education, and welfare part of my plan, where we're going to supplement all kinds of research uh, for medicine and scientific research and to uh, plan for the future in terms of uh, clean energy sources and to provide uh, right into the future is that we're going to manage this, this full faith certificate issue uh, very carefully. And so this is, uh, uh, there's no idea we can create a model society here. I, and I, I would say overnight with this plan, just in terms of what, what we can put into the society. And I found Thomas that in my dealings with people and dealings with large society that I'm dealing with now, that people just want to be able to go out into the world and make a living, come home, to their families and enjoy their lives, and this is if we provide them with the means to do that, this is going to be a wonderful society. And uh, the imprinting carries a lot of weight. We can imprint on these children, on our children, at a very early age, starting at five or six, the qualities of life that we want to see persevere here. Uh, I am sure that we can, within a generation, we can turn this whole thing around, and we're going to be a productive society. But we all know what obscenity is and immorality is. We don't need to see this on TV. Uh, this is a private issue of the First Amendment rights. So um, let them in if, they, if it's a private matter, uh, I'm sure. But uh, we all know what it is when we see it, and it, it's a very uh, ugly thing. We don't want it coming into our, uh, our homes and influencing our children in that way. So uh, we need to take care of that. That is one of the issues that the... Uh, the morality clause issue and that we need to sit down as a Congress and debate upon, discuss upon, and uh, as well as the humane standards for the United States, how we're going to go about how we treat our livestock that's coming in for the slaughter and treat other animals and things like that. This is a, we stay on, stand on a humane foundation, and a humane foundation for our society as well. This is inhumane to treat the people as some part of the population that they're able to be exploited by another part simply because they don't have a, a minimum wage law that they needed to adjust a long, long time ago. So that is yeah, actually, I just have one other main yeah, issue go ahead. Go ahead. to discuss with you, and that is the clarification of the civil rights psychiatric laws here in this country. Uh, you know, the Fifth Amendment... Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments to the Constitution uh, guarantee the rights to a, a trial, uh, a jury trial, and the rights to an attorney to be provided to you. But 
for psychiatric accusations, they can take any person away by any two physicians signing a paper, treat them with anything that they want to treat them, any psychiatric drug, um, shock therapy, and surgery without even going to court, and never seeing a, never seeing a judge and put them away for it forever, and nobody will do anything about it. So uh, what I'm going to get is some representation to re-clarify these psychiatric laws so that they will have due process rights, uh, particularly the right uh, to what, what constitutes a psychiatric charge, uh, what, how long, uh, what constitutes uh, the rights to uh, commitment, and uh, how, how long a person will have to, to uh, suffer without, not have to suffer without an attorney being present to represent them. And the rights to confrontation of testimony, just the same as in uh, this, will, this will come under the 14th Amendment. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But it's already Absolutely. covered, but it's not, it's just being gotten away with. And, and throw that right back into the drugs. They can drop drugs on anybody and then make them crazy, and then all of a sudden they're uh, in a psychiatric court and they have no rights. Sure. Uh, how are they going to defend themselves? What happened to them? So. This is something that we need to think about. Is one one loophole in the in the law that we need to clear up. Uh, that would be uh, one of my That's things. That's a good that point, I'm... Gary. I have not heard anyone bring that up, but I have heard other people bring up, um, you know, the Fourth Amendment, and the Fifth Amendment, and uh, you know, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. But that specific example, I have not heard, and and I'm glad uh, that you brought it up. Uh, it's something brand new, and it deserves more attention. Um, you know, we want to do unto others as we want to do unto ourselves. That's called consistency, and that's what integrity is made out of, uh, being consistent. And um, now, uh, let's see. Let's see, we covered a lot of issues. Actually, I did. What about trade? That's why I wanted to ask you about our foreign policy. Um, should we have more trade? Um, how should that trade be? Um, are we getting ripped off by other countries? Um, would we have more peace and prosperity if we traded with other countries more so? You know, the countries you trade with, less likely you're going to go to war with. How would you approach our relations with other countries and our trade policies? Well, Thomas, I, it has to be a fair balance of trade. I, this is I've been on the news. Uh, NAFTA and the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement uh, were just being shortchanged by cheap production uh, um, being take, being undermining our industries, our industries moving out of the United States and going to foreign countries. So this is something we need to sharply curtail by imposing a fair balance of trade tariffs and uh, taxes on, on corporations that uh, manufacture outside of the United States and ship their drugs, uh, ship their products back into the United States. And uh, also, I might add that there's drugs in Mexico, so that's all coming back up there with the drugs. They're not even checking that. And the containers coming in from China, they're not checking those either. And uh, Afghanistan is just the uh, Taliban. They go, oh, they fought a war there, and they didn't destroy the opium crop. They left that. It's been the bane of Europe. It's the destruction of Europe. And all of our, all the Western countries are under this horrible influence of uh, what I want to talk about here. And basically, it's the sovereignty of the American people and what that means to you. Sovereignty, the American sovereignty. It's not up for grabs as to in, just in, invade us with all kinds of foreign people, and all of a sudden the American people are not the sovereign here anymore. That's not going to happen. There's going to be a war for that. So uh, we need to establish firmly in the eyes of everyone that's here that we are an American country stemming from the foundation of our heritage, what that means, the Europe, Central European country that, that founded America. And uh, so that's not going to be taken away from us. This all happened. Civil rights did not intend for the United States to be overthrown by foreign people that are just flocking here, and, and many of whom don't even like us. So uh, I think this is a major issue. I'm going to bring this up if I get uh, into Washington bring this up and have a firm discussion on what exactly uh, the sovereignty issue is here. Who, who are the American people? The sovereignty issue is, uh, has to do with who's going to control the atomic weapons. So uh, it, it just can't be. They just can't invade us with all these 40 million um, Mexicans and Latin Americans, and all of a sudden they're given amnesty, and now they're citizens, and uh, they're developing their own culture here among us. I, I, my heart goes out to everybody that's, that's here. I, 
I, personally, I love I love the difference in everybody. I like seeing different people. But uh, the sovereignty has to come into question again, Thomas. That would be yeah, my point. Yeah, and I can hear, um, like, I think some of the threads that you're saying is, you know, the working people have not been represented in a long time. Uh, most people just really want to be left alone to live their lives. Um, people want a fair playing field. Um you know, and some of the issues that show that, you know, you do have a good heart. I mean, you're considering, you know, some form of reparations, your agriculture uh, and, and your due process. Um, as, regarding the reparations, I mean, one could make an argument, even if you did do reparations for, you know, black citizens that had ancestors in slavery, um, that money would just go right back into the economy anyways. And plus, you'll probably uplift a lot of people. You know, not everyone, but probably a large majority of the people who would receive those, um, you know, probably would spend it wisely or invest in their children's education and, uh, you know, buy a new home or something like that. So it would just go right back into the economy consumer base that everyone would probably benefit out of anyways. So um, now... Uh, what about the, I just want to follow up on the agriculture um, issue one more time about treating animals because uh, yeah could you just follow up on that a little bit Gary if you don't mind yes uh, we we need to very, be very protective of our uh, of our animals and our attitude towards <clears throat> towards the livestock and make sure that they're all treated humanely uh, in their conditions um, they are slaughtered <clears throat> but. Um, in the in the terms of um, what we can do to ease their suffering in, a, in any way that we possibly can, we should all we should take advantage of this. Set laws aside to do this for us. So as a nation, sure. so that everybody looks out and sees that uh, we're respectful of the other life forms that are here. We live on a planet in, a, in outer space. It's a mir- I'm always amazed. It's a miracle to look up at the stars. I say, jeepers, we're alive here on a planet in the middle of mm-hmm. nowhere. <laughs> And I'm sure we can come to some terms of how we should govern ourselves appropriately and treat the life respectfully that we have around us. And that would go for uh, the environment, too, to take care of the environment, the habitats uh, that uh, these animals need to live in, thrive in, in the wild, to look out for them and not be so commercially overpowering these these environmental habitats. And uh, I just want to mention uh, one other thing about the humane closet. Uh, as we're dealing with the reparations for the black slavery issue. What I, what I specifically have in mind was to provide meaningful work into those communities with the, uh, the full faith fiat legislation and also to upgrade their education system uh, with, with money, an infusion of money, uh, with fiat uh, issue money, and uh, to take care of these, these people, also to remove the drugs, as, as we discussed. And so that we everybody would get off in a fresh start, but uh, they just want to be able to go to work and uh, come and work and put in a good day's work, quality, meaningful jobs that we can put. All the government agencies could be enhanced, and uh, and we could develop all kinds of uh, urban programs for these people. And so, uh, I, in my terms of reparation, they're not just handing them money, but handing them the means to survive at, at a dignified and respectable level. That's what they're complaining about. There's no jobs for these kids. They, Unemployment rate is 38, 40 percent for these black youths, and not just blacks, but the Hispanics as well. And um, they, they they can't understand that these people are coming, foreign people are coming here with third people, third world mentality, and taking our jobs away because they they don't care that to make the money. They don't to to them the middle class is all but dead here now for us. But to them, it's something that's it's a step up from where they're coming from, the slums of Haiti. Right, so uh, we have to be very protective of our own economy here, what, what, the American economy, what represents the middle class, and it can't be left up to the employers, the ethical integrity of the employers anymore, because the accountants have taken over. And what they're doing, they, they take people in on turnover, and they promise them they're going to give them a good wage, and they work their tails off for two years, and then when they look for the raise, they're treated meanly. This is called turnover, and they're they're made to quit or they're trumped up charges, they're forced to be fired, and then they hire new people, start up uh, wages all over again. It's called turnover, turnover abuse. So we've got to fix all these problems up, uh, Thomas. Let's just hope I get elected because I don't see 
what's uh, out there going to do the job for us. I mean, I can, I've been lobbying these these issues all along for the last 20 years uh, since I've been here in Florida in the year 2000 with the uh, previous incumbent, Andrew Crenshaw, and it's gone, nothing has gone anywhere. So this is I well, want, that's why I'm running for Congress. Just two more final questions here. One is um, what kind of message do you think it would send if you were elected to Washington, especially as a no-party affiliation? Um, you know, even if you were just the only, or maybe there could be a handful of independents elected this year to the 435 member of the U.S. House, uh, which is all Republicans and Democrats, do you think that would send a message? And what kind of message would it send if it does? The message I would send, Thomas, is that we need to take care of business. We need to sit down, like they're talking about a convention of states now, to sit down and rewrite the ideology of the nation. At the foundation at the foundation level of what we are as a nation who we are and what we hope to accomplish here and uh, not to leave it the way it's been as an incorporated uh, form of uh, tyranny of, of greed and corruption that nobody seems to be able to do anything about we can do something about it if we sit down we have the right voice in Washington to sit down with everybody and call the mediation into into convene and uh, have uh, all these all these people get together and let's just discuss what we need to do here. There's a lot of the other issues that are being debated and discussed. These are relevant minor laws that need to be passed. Uh, but the big foundation laws that, that, we, that we're grouping for here, these need to be taken care of. And uh, if I'm elected, I intend to forcefully go to each representative in Washington, the Senate and uh, the House, Talk to each of them and see what they want to do, and see what, and appeal to everybody forcefully. Appeal that we need to take care of this uh, serious business right now. And so that would be my contribution if I can uh, hopefully get there. Now, who's some of your favorite people, uh, Gary? And by the way, we're talking with Gary Konas, um, Gary G A R Y Konas K O N I Z. For forcongress.com and um, running for the uh, U.S. House of Representatives, District 4 in Florida. Uh, Gary, may I ask you, who are some of your favorite people, past or present? Please. Well, I always liked Richard Nixon. Uh, tell you the truth, I think he got a bad deal. I think what was happening there was the, uh, there was a bad drug war going on at the time, and he had just gotten the troops home from Vietnam. I think he was being hit with LSD. I think he had some horrible trouble. I, that, that was when the LSD PCP war was going on. So I think he had, uh, as the commander in chief, he had uh, some business to discuss with the uh, political party in power of, of, the, of the Democrats uh, at that time to, uh, in terms of the subversiveness of the drug warfare. <clears throat> so uh, that was just my take on him. But uh, I did like him uh, as a man. And uh, Jimmy Carter I liked very well. I liked Ronald Reagan. I liked uh, President George Bush, both both presidents. And uh, Bill Clinton I liked very much. And uh, also I liked President Obama. He's, uh, he's a very sincere man. He speaks well. And uh, I think he has a, a lot of uh, deep emotional conflicts on his plate that he's been having to grapple with. Uh, concerning the black people and his black heritage. I'd like to see I wanted him to be successful. And I think that goes... And Hillary Clinton, I'd like to see her. Uh, she's. Um, I'd like to see her become successful. She's tried hard, very hard. But uh, Donald Trump... Uh, I don't think they want Donald Trump because uh, he means business. He he represents the Americans. Uh, he, represent, he doesn't want the, the invasion to continue on with amnesty. So... We're at an impasse there as to what's going on. Uh, let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and see what happens, Thomas. Yeah, and let me ask one follow-up question. What branch of the military were you in again, Gary? I was were... in the army. Uh, so the I army. Was, okay. We was, was I was in the era of the draft, 1964. So uh, I uh, enlisted in the engineers, the Corps of Engineers, to run heavy equipment. And that's what I did in Vietnam. We ran in the heavy equipment in the jungle. So um, I came home and uh, 
I got a job with a, as a heavy equipment operator with the union, the International Union of Operating Engineers, and put myself through college. I got a commercial pilot's license. I graduated summa cum laude from college, became a press reporter, and uh, I was on uh, President Reagan's uh, task force to break the cone of silence regarding mafia drug warfare that was going on. And uh, from there, uh, we, I moved to Buffalo, and I became uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan's press aide and uh, advisor and personal assistant. And we handled the drug war from 1989 to 2000 when he retired. And that's when we moved here, my wife and I, to Jacksonville, Florida. She works as a nurse at Baptist Hospital. She's a psychiatric nurse. So that's our, that's our history. Uh, so I had plenty of aptitude for what needs to be done here. I sure. just need the format to be able to get get there to do it. And hopefully I've uh, been persuading, I've been emailing uh, everybody, and contacting everybody personally and discussing, uh, going to all these different meetings and discussion groups. So I'm hopefully I'll be able to break the Republican block that uh, is going to occur here. So I'm up against the Republicans. Yeah, well, people have got to believe it and they got to feel confident. Maybe... Um you know, the presidential election might be a little more divisive. People are going to, you know, pretty much, I guess, have their minds made up. But the Congress, that's up more up for grabs, at least, I would say, and a lot less divisive. And, um, and well, good luck in your campaign, and, and thank you very much for the interview. We appreciate it a lot. And I uh, do thank you for being open and letting our audience know some of the, another person who's going to be on the ballot, another independent candidate, and uh, the only independent choice in your district. And so uh, good luck, Gary, and take care, and good to talk with you. Thanks very much. Thomas, I did enjoy speaking with you so much. I like you. You are a really in, in fine and incisive commentator, and I hope that uh, respectfully we can have some uh, more time together in the future. Have a very good evening. Absolutely, we can. Um, well, take care, Gary. Thanks a lot. Take care, Thomas. Good night.